morning, everyone. Welcome to the first of our Automate webinar series. My name is Charles, and I'll be the facilitator for today. I'm absolutely thrilled to have all of you here today. So before we dive into the exciting content that we have planned for you today, let me just briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm a senior engagement manager uh, from Bernie Group, part of the technology and automation practice. Uh, joined Bernie Group approximately one year ago. Prior to that, I was with Ernest & Young for a little over five years in their technology consulting practice with a focus on intelligent automation. So before we get started, uh, I'd like to cover just a, a few housekeeping items. Um, so this session will be recorded and shared right after the webinar. Um, the, uh, during our presentation time, the webinar will be in a listen-only mode. Uh, and if you have any questions, please just submit your questions through the chat. Um, and we'll get to them um, at the end. So now let's talk about you know, why we're here. So our webinar today is all about how to gain efficiency using automation, generative AI, and business process management. Um, and here with us today, we have Najib from Bernie Group and Mohammed from Casilio. I'll let them do a quick introduction. Yeah, Mohammed. thank you, Charles. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me on this webinar. Uh, Mohammed al Sanawi, SVP Enterprise Applications at Consilio. I've been in my role now for over four years uh, with Consilio. Before that, a uh, long career with uh, both private equity portfolio companies and management consulting. Uh, very happy to be sharing our uh, journey into automation and digital transformation and, and chatting about uh, what is going on in the space and how our experience plays out into it. Wonderful. Thank, thanks. All right. Thank you, Mohammed. Thanks, Thank Mohammed. Um, my name is Najib Sauer. I lead the technology and automation practice at Bernie Group. I'll echo what Charles said. We're thrilled to have everyone on the call today. Um, this is our first of uh, four webinars. We hope to do more uh, consistently throughout. So thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to, uh, to sort of join us here. So I'll pass it to Charles to kick us off. All right, sounds good. And with that, let's kick off our webinar. So the first question um, will be for Mohammed. Um, can you just, just uh, briefly provide an overview of Concilio's current journey with workflow automation? Uh, for an organization with kind of high complexity and unique. Yeah, sure, positions. absolutely. Just in a quick introduction to Concilio, we are the market leader in our space, which is uh, the e-discovery space, legal services. And um, as part of being the market leader and with uh, rapid growth that we've been having the last few years, uh, there was you know very clear direction from uh, our leadership team and our kind of investors and board to, to look at opportunities for us to truly take our workflows internally, both employee focused and client focused, the next level, uh, supporting us with our scale and, and the journey as we continue to grow. Um, our probably our close, you know, first, uh, uh, you know, clear foray into into automation and transforming our workflows kicked off around 18 months ago. Uh, and it, it focuses primarily on a, an implementation of ServiceNow to truly transform our client service delivery uh, workflows, processes, and ensure that what we have in place is as automated as possible, as seamless as possible, allowing our teams to work efficiently and effectively internally, and to drive our client experience and as well as our employee experience to that next level. So it's been it's been this it feels like a very long journey so far. Just a lot going on uh, on my side, but at the same time, super exciting. The fact that we are uh, breaking a lot of the barriers and the status quo pieces around how things were done in this industry for a long time, and and I think we're at the forefront of of making sure that uh, we continue to go in this space. All right, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Najib, um, from your perspective, how has the recent technology advancement and enhanced connectivity with intelligent automation and AI transformed the way organization can think about distributing and tracking work? Thanks, Charles. Uh, it's a great question. So workflow and business process management as a capability has been around for decades. It's not going to go anywhere, but the core functionality historically and even now as, as our clients and organizations work through it is to Simply put, try to ingest triage and route work the most effective way possible while providing a mechanism for us to track and manage where things are, where, where work packages are and, and governance around it. So whether that's originating from a customer inquiry through an email or whether it's an internal you know, um, case coming in through a ticketing system 
or a third party like a vendor or a lawyer sending in information to sort of add to or start off a case to, to do some work in the back office. So work is then typically received or curated and done in, you know, external source systems or productivity tools and then updated in within a, a workflow console to basically move work along or give leadership a, a view on where work packages are. So it's been an extremely effective capability at managing consistent volume processes to track performance, manage escalations, compliance adherences, um, and effectively really allocate our teams when we see volume spikes. So where workflow is really critical is to make sure we have as up-to-date data as possible, as well as reduce the amount of manual touch points in there so that we can handle volume spikes as they come in. Because as we know, our teams and our operators are so critical to executing these tasks that when bottlenecks come in, they 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 put risk to our SLA adherences or our customer expectations and, and things of that sort. So organizations that have gone through a workflow journey will know, or those of you just embarking on one, um, work, workflow is a really core capability that can sit enterprise wide, or it can be within a you know certain application to, to help execute tasks within an operation. However, a key challenge based on what I mentioned before is the timeliness of data coming into that workflow and the amount of automation around it is so critical so that we can make sure the data is in there is as, as up-to-date as possible. Um, you, you can imagine you, you receive a case through an email or you, know, you get a work item yourself and you're working it on the side. The last thing you wanna do is update a, a workflow system or a tracking tool. You just wanna sort of get the job done but from an operations governance perspective, getting the most up-to-date uh, data on where work patches are is, is so critical to running an end-to-end -end operation effectively. Um, so our people and our operators are still needed to do the bulk of the work, particularly on um, tasks that are more unstructured in nature. So um, these are things that are coming in through email, through paper forms, through uh, large texts or legal documents that automation end-to-end -end is, is quite challenging to do because the rules are a little bit more gray or you need a human eye to validate whether a document is indeed a, a certain entity or if it's something else. So what is really possible today, particularly with advances in AI and automation, is we're not just allowed to do work better. So the the, the literature around things like Gen AI and, and other automation tools are helping us work more productively is, is quite robust in, in anywhere on the internet you look, but it can also, also let us do workflow better. And what I mean by that is we can automate higher proportions of ingestion, higher proportions of triage, higher proportions of routing, but also support with fulfillment activities that are less limited by how rules-based something is. So um, the easy stuff can still be automated, that's straightforward. So if you think about simple IT tickets and, and routing, you know, password changes of the sort, but we're able to tackle more unstructured requests than ever before. So advances in the AI, particularly, as I mentioned before, with large language models, Gen AI, computer vision, intelligent document processing, not to mention a slew of others that are up and coming, more options exist to help go through not just the first mile of getting work in, supporting systems through core software, but also helping end to end get to fulfillment with as much speed as possible. So um, imagine a few scenarios to try and make this real for you. So. A really problem, um, you know, com common problem or context within um, most financial services is as they're onboarding customers, they need to do uh, know your customer type work. So that that requires, you know, them to receive data from either a broker or a branch or another sales um, organization to determine if the financial institution should get into business with this particular individual. Um, within this type of request, there's typically things that are lower hanging fruit in terms of automatability. You know, you know, for every case, you have to do a background check. You have to do a credit check. These type of activities can be automated through, you know, ingestion through workflow, but connecting with traditional, you know, automation tools like iPads or integration with native systems or robotics process automation to just help trigger the manual, uh, the manual intensive that, but also rules based types of activities. But now with combinations of Gen AI through its chat and data extraction interface and intelligent document processing, organizations can use technology to extract the context from things like statements, from legal reviews, from purchases, look through all of these attachments to summarize the information, reply back to the customer with a tailored message, and also route the work to the most appropriate teams where it knows when to do so. Also, it can provide triage agents with enough context so that when these automations and workflows aren't sure where the work should go to, it can give the triage operator a starting point so that they're not starting from scratch. This is truly a game changer for high volume and highly complex processes, 
particularly as you're trying to adhere to a, a tight customer expe expectation or an SLA or an OLA that you're working towards. Um, from a fulfillment perspective, tasks can be um, like sort of routed to operators in some combination of some really, really powerful capabilities. You can, as I mentioned before, provide clear summaries of the work, not just start from scratch. We can provide mechanisms for you know our operators to interact with the documents coming in through a workflow tool so that they can query things quickly, much like you would do a Google search. You could do a search on the documents that it has ingested into these large language models. Um, we can also establish mechanisms for bringing in data from external um, sources, whether it's Google or weather or things like that. But truly the nature here is to empower our teams in workflow and fulfillment with the information they need to get the work to the right people as fast as, as quickly and effectively as possible while giving our operators that are actually doing the work the, the, the highest amount of a starting point that they can get um, instead of just starting from scratch. So I truly see that as the ecosystem laying on top of enhancing workflow to just helping us work more effective. Najib, I want to touch on a couple of points you've made. I mean, it's yeah. just to attest to some of the the pieces you've mentioned from from my experience. I think that the first piece you mentioned around data is, is super critical, right? From from experience, I can say that before jumping into the automation project we have on in our on our plate, we really kicked off with understanding what data exists around our different systems. I think within you know enterprise applications here, we have around thirty five systems that are interconnected. And at the beginning, it was really understanding, you know, what the state of data is. There was a huge data cleanup effort. Alongside that, there was a master data management effort as well to really ensure our understanding of where the source of truth should lie for each of these data pieces, as well as, the, you know, putting in place governance models that ensure that once we clean the data and ingest the right data into the right system, that those are continue to be, uh, to maintain the integrity of all of that. So I, I agree with you 100% that is super critical. It's not an easy job, but it's a very important job to do that initially before you start jumping into automation of these, uh, these different processes. And just a, a piece around complexity, right? It's, you know, we have around 12 playbooks at least that we are delivering uh, to automate within uh, ServiceNow and, and with the other integrations that we have in place. And each of these is a different team that talking to each other. They're getting data from different places. We have at least five or six systems that we're integrating internally to ServiceNow to ensure that we have, the team has the right reporting and dashboards to make decisions. Uh, one of our key objectives was around, you know, how do we ensure decision making is in place for our different teams? And with that, we're we're you know truly kind of thinking about you know how to include some of the technologies you've mentioned, like generative AI, predictive analytics. And we feel strongly that there's a use case there uh, to ensure us to get to the right place. But I think step one is really just getting a I mean, good understanding of the data and at the same time, the different playbooks that we need to have in place and the, what enhancements we need to put in place to ensure that the teams are seamlessly working together with the right data in front of them. That's up. very helpful, Mohammed. Um, and just to build on that, how did you get, how did your team kind of identify which processes are the most suitable candidate for these uh, workflow automation? And you know, for 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 people that are just starting their workflow automation journey, uh, what criteria yeah, should they be? I think consider? as a for profit business, the the simple answer is we need to follow the ROI. Um, so the the business case really kicked off around, and ROI doesn't have to be solely financial, right? There are qualitative metrics that are certainly very important return on investment uh, areas that we need, we looked at. At the very beginning, we we surveyed our teams, right? We the, the idea was our, our biggest return would be in the delivery of services to our clients. So that's, as you can imagine, the largest uh, group within our business that is offering services to our clients uh, through our workflows. We are, at the end of the day, a technology in our enabled services company in our space. And from there, really trying to understand, we try to quickly understand with them through surveys, through interviews, through workshop sessions, what are the, the bottlenecks that exist within those delivery workflows or the, the 12 or so that I mentioned. And it was pretty clear when, when as we dug into that, uh, that there are tremendous amounts of time being spent and, and, and hours being spent on manual processes, times where our, especially our project managers, would spend on uh, either manually inputting data into systems or navigating between different systems to find different pieces of data in responding to our clients. And as, as Najib, I think, mentioned SLAs, ensuring that SLAs are in place. So the speed 
of, of getting that service to our client was critical. And we found that there is tremendous opportunity to accelerate how fast a, a project manager or any other delivery manager is able to find the data they need to respond to a client request and at the same time not having to really manually work the data from the different systems that exist. So we ended up having ServiceNow being kind of the repository of all the data that is needed for someone to, to access. And I think a big just I want to reiterate how, how important it is to have accurate data coming from the right source. So we spending the time to think about these sources of data and ensuring that we have accurate data that these teams can then access, report on, and have dashboards available to them at different levels, from a manager level all the way to a kind of an, an implementation person level. Ensure all that data is accurate, is available to them seamlessly so that they can get to where they need to be as, as fast as possible. So, you know, at the, at the, at the root of it, when, by, by fixing those pieces around timeliness of, of, of getting to the data, accuracy of data, availability of it, and having that seamless switch between tasks, between folks versus kind of an old IT ticketing model that we had will enable us to really get to a better, I mean, our top objective was client satisfaction and client experience, as well as, as you can imagine, employee experience plays a big part here. Your, uh, the hope was, the team is going to be working in more exciting stuff where we took out the overhead and the manual processes they're working on. So that gave us a, a double bonus there, as well as at that point, you know, you're, you're then talking about achievement, better achievement of SLA. So that truly just impacts the bottom line at the end of the day for us by, by doing all these things. Uh, and the journey continues. I think we've, uh, we see this as a phase one. There's always a phase two and a phase three. And I think that, you know, just touching on the Jeep's pieces again around generative AI and kind of predictive analytics and stuff, ServiceNow and other tools will enable us to go deeper, right? We, we're looking at things like, you know, intelligent virtual assistants, where once we open the tool up for our clients, once we, you know, kind of figure out and ensure the use case internally is working, there, the idea is then through our client portal are able to interact with us through generative AI in the back end, asking questions that is most important to them to them through the tool. The tool is obviously learning in the background as to how to answer these questions better. So instead of sending an email or opening a ticket, they're able to access these answers much, much quicker, as well as internally, a big, a big use case that we're also piloting and looking into is uh, the idea of kind of predictive IT ops uh, within the tool, which basically allows our IT folks as they think about the, uh, the systems, uh, availability and, and responsiveness to find um, any potential issues before they occur. And I'm super excited personally about this, this one because it, it allows the team then to you know, predict and react much faster through the, you know, you know, the AI engines in the, back, in the back end to ensure that we're not waiting for something to go wrong, rather they're ahead of the game uh, in that space. Lots of use cases, lots of opportunity. I'm, I think I'm just touching the surface here in terms of what is possible uh, as we go through the, the following phases of these projects. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, Najib, um, last question from me. What are some of the uh, emerging trends in workflow automation and how do you think they align with the evolving landscape of the intelligent automation and artificial intelligence? Nijit, you muted. Sorry, guys. Um, thanks, Charles. And I, I think Mohammed touched on the, the most critical one is optionality. So there are so many different ways to leverage these advancements in, in artificial intelligence, whether it's you know directly working with your Azure, or Google, Amazon on the large language models with, with Bedrock or um, GPT-4, um, or leveraging core software that are building this into their platform. So things like ServiceNow, they're building in the Gen AI capability, they're building in, they, they're already a core workflow ticketing system, and then you could sort of latch automation on top of it. But then there's other other options too, where you um, may have a core incumbent automation tool that's a pure play like a, a SNC Blue Prism, where they've got the sort of workflow capability and connectors available. So the way to approach the problem at hand, the options are a lot more um, uh, plentiful than, you would have in, in other business problems you're probably solving that are very strictly financed, very strictly accounts payable. So where organizations are going to have a, a really important time navigating the space is making sure they choose the right 
solution architecture that fits within their existing operation because it's very rare we're all starting from scratch. Most companies already have some, some version of a workflow tool, whether it's working or not is a separate question, but there's already a, a backbone of how things are being coming in or not. And replacing that with something completely net new, obviously is, is going to require a cost investment design. But as, as our organization's clients, peers are working through this, um, I, I urge them to really scan the market on the possible patterns that you can use to solve an individual problem but don't discount the other problems that these tools can have so that you can be a bit more cohesive in the way you approach them. Um, like there, there's gonna be situations where you can use workflow to trigger automations individually within a workflow tool that are you know, quite seamless, but there might be situations where you need to add in human in the loop type functionality to, to validate information with an operator before it goes out to the client because it's higher risk, which might require a different posture in, in the way you sort of articulate your your solution architecture. So the space is changing so quickly. We, we do our best at, at Bernie Group to try and keep a pulse of it, but it changes weekly. And I think as you start to look through particularly large language models, Gen AI, uh, document processing, computer vision, a lot of the things around unstructured data, it's what are the right tools or combination of tools to solve our largest problems? And, and don't overcomplicate your, your ecosystem or you're gonna end up managing too many vendors with too many um, throats to choke and not having cohesion in your architecture. All right, thank you, Najib. Um, we're going to start the Q&A. So if you have any question, please type it in chat. Um, well, in the meantime, um, you know, I have one more question for Mohammed. So Mohammed, you know, earlier you mentioned, um, you know, workflow automation impacting and improving overall employee experience. Um, can, you, can you tell us, uh, you know, what steps are you taking to ensure that workflow automation actually enhances productivity and job satisfaction within your um, organization? Uh, as I mentioned, I mean, that was a truly a key objective for us as, uh, as we have grown in size and scale. I mean, we are a company with thousands of employees across the globe and uh, one of the, you know, important pieces of us to in ensuring that we are successful, a key success criteria for us was to ensure that post automation, post changes in our workflow, that the team not only maintains their kind of trust in, in the system and their ability to deliver, but actually improve their, their performance and, and, and productivity and, and satisfaction. And you know, one of the, the ways we, we aim to do that is truly engage with the business uh, at a, as broadly as possible, bring in all of these voices around what is needed for them to be more and more successful, not limit ourselves to kind of higher level managerial positions for these discussions, but we went actually to almost shadow folks uh, in the day to day to ensure that we are understanding of the, the bottlenecks and the gaps and the issues they are facing on a day to day basis. And we actually had, you know, at that point, very early on engaged with the burning group that helped us as a consulting partner to, to go through some of that current state assessment and, and business process mapping and having these interviews and workshops in place that were, you know, very long hours, but very important hours to really get us to where we are today. The, the key piece is really, as you can imagine, change is difficult. And one of the areas that areas that we have spent a ton of time on is to truly up, up you know, upskill our organizational change management teams uh, with you know to ensure that as we go through this transition our teams are not feeling burdened by the change rather they see the value and no matter how much you think from from my seat right that you're you're at the forefront of technology that this is a great project i mean i can continue talking about these messages to ensure the team is, is bought in but the only way someone will truly buy in is to for them to be in the system, to see it, to play around with it, and to ensure that their voices are heard in terms of the bottlenecks we're trying to serve and, and change are the ones that they care about. So that was a, you know, almost a day, day by day process, right? Engage the teams. We created change champions across uh, all of our affected employee groups. We have you know, periodic communication about the status of the project and how this will impact them. We even went out to our clients, some of our key clients, and ensured that they're engaged in, in what the delivery processes will look like for them as we improve our systems and automate and bring in some of these technologies, like, as I mentioned, you know, virtual, virtual intelligent virtual assistant and so on that will impact them in the future. So it's truly a, you know, just 
hand holding right at, at the very very core of it to ensure that we are as, as many folks are included in the discussion early on and then as we have started to go go live recently is getting that feedback from them on where things are headed right and how they're feeling about the system and building stories and, and, and future phases where we're actually continuing that journey because it's not a one you know it's not a one phase thing right you're, you're, you're kicked off you're, you're getting it done now but then you're building to something even bigger in the future especially with the speed of in the jeep gave us a good number of ideas and, and on, on both systems and, and new technologies it's truly in my mind you know we're just scratching the surface across these these things like you know chat gpt has started hearing about it this year I, i'm sure there'll be something bigger and better within chat gpt within other tools there's, there's more technologies coming so staying up to speed on these things uh and, and trying not to be overwhelmed by all of it is, is definitely a challenge but at the same time it's so exciting just to be part of, of this the, you know of this I would say technological transformation around automation and around kind of intelligence across our, you know, the systems we're dealing with and the ability to continue to, to be um, growing as these systems grow to maintain a competitive advantage, right, as a company like ours, for instance. So this, the journey is just starting, but I, I'm, it's, it's, in my mind, it impacts the whole business and it's uh, the right place to be uh, for anyone interested in, in venturing into it. All right, thank you, Mohammed. Um, it looks like we have a we have a, a questions um, we have a question from the chat. Um, so first one: um, What challenges or obstacle can an organization expect when transitioning to automated workflow, and how can they overcome them? Would you like me to answer that? Uh, yeah, sure, I think yeah. the main challenge again is is the difficulty of change. I think right. So so building a true um baseline for why we are making this change i think is pretty critical for the team understanding number one who are your user groups that are being affected by the change getting them involved really on building these change champions i think is super critical and then truly getting a, a clear view of the current state of the of the processes that you want to automate and that's sometimes you know, different people will have different pieces of the puzzle especially if you're working with the siloed it ticketing mentality that may exist getting the, the bridges or the, the pieces that link these teams together early on, understanding what that looks like to get that full view picture through process mapping, through other tools that you may have in, you know, at, at your disposal, is pretty critical to ensure that you know, challenges as you go through are, are being are kind of uh, hit, hit right on and, and really uh, mitigated as you go through. And I think that the other biggest challenge is you know, continuing that uh, ability to enhance because there's really no end game here. Um, so building the phasing is, is key. And I think we've gone back and forth of what a phase one looks like, what a pilot looks like, right? I think piloting is, is in my mind, is very critical to start small and then grow because this big bang approach with such a significant amount of automation and this new technology is gonna be very difficult. So, and I'm managing, again, the per perception, managing, getting buy-in from all the teams to be speaking you know, the language of, of the someone implementing, I think is key and, and ensuring that change management is in place. And if I just add to, right, thanks, add to that, Mohammed, I think particularly as organizations delve into the generative uh, capabilities, the monitoring of the efficacy and the performance of those models over time as data and processes changes is, is absolutely critical. You might have a threshold to be like, hey, I'm, you know, 90% confidence is fine, 95% confidence is fine. But as you're working with these models, really testing their efficacy and their effectiveness to reaching it. So you, you're, you're going to have to tweak them. Once you're dealing with the gray, it's not binary. It's not like, hey, I have a user story. It needs to be met. It's done. It's I need to be able to query this type of information in an effective manner. That requirement by in its in isolation is, is quite difficult to get 100% of the time. So. I think maintenance as you get into the the AI elements requires thoughtfulness on how to just make sure you're always getting the, the highest efficacy and effectiveness from those models um, in a workflow setting or outside of workflow. Fully agree. All right, thank you. We just have one more last, uh, one last question to go through. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this question is what kind of ongoing support and maintenance should we expect when implementing a workflow automation solution and how, and how can we ensure that 
it continues to meet our evolving needs. Like a great, great question. It's, uh, Mohammed, do you want to go first? It, and then you know, make... it's, uh, again, it's, a, it, this, any change you would make at the scale, at, at least for us from, from experience is, is significant. Um, and really what is needed once you, once you get it live is to truly have a full support network that starts with the right team in place um, to ensure that you know there's there the, the stakeholders are impacted always have their voices heard so and at the same time issues that come up as they would are being addressed very quickly and efficiently as well as the vision for what the, the product we're putting in place like ServiceNow or any automation tool is actually being is living it to, living to its expectation so a few roles we had to create, we had to build sometimes teams from scratch, especially on the engineering development side for some of these new new technologies. But it all starts with having you know, application owners, someone that the business stakeholder in this case can go to, to, to really discuss tactical as well as strategic roadmap issues of where fa the phasing of, of growth looks like. There's another very important team, which is you know, supported administration teams who so have a few admins that are really continually looking at any any issues coming from the field as well as ensuring that main, maintenance of the actual software which could happen very very rapidly some of these tools are like every every quarter you're looking at at a, at a new upgrade with new functionality so staying ahead of that and ensuring that you are maintaining and growing that system without any glitches is key and then i would say finally is is having a a robust you know kind of an agile development team whether in-house or with a with a partner that enables you to quickly jump on and any roadmap items and any things that you really continue to need to continue to improve to get you to that next level that you want you pursue with uh, with this uh, technology and development. Anything to add, Najib? No, I think we're over time. No. All right, sounds good. Um, so before we close off, um, just like to remind everyone that we have another uh, automate webinar next week. Um, October 25th, same time, 11 to 11:30. Um, the topic will be focused on um, will, will be focused on you know uh, boosting uh, your uh, tips to boost your bot production. So we have a uh, again the Jeep with us, and we have uh, Adrian from C2 that will be joining us. Thank, Thank you, you everyone for attending. Thanks so much, everyone. See you next week.